So hello everyone and welcome to our weekly webinar after a week off. Today we have another museum staff member with us, um, Babs Worthy, who many of you probably know. She's been working with the museum for several years on different projects um, and contracts, but just last fall she became a full-fledged employee and she's now our visitor and member services coordinator. Um, most of you probably know her in some of her other roles, which is a writer, director, producer, performer. She uh, worked for two decades um, as a drama and document documentary producer for CBC Radio. She, she's enjoyed a 20 year association with the Shaw Festival, including acting, writing and producing. She also taught at both Brock University and Niagara College and is a creative producer and content provider for many local arts organizations in the Niagara region. So, <laughs> so today Babs is going to be taking us on a virtual scandal and gossip tour of Niagara and the Lake. Babs did a, a physical tour for us last year um, that a lot of people really enjoyed. So she's going to bring back some of our favorite stories from there and she's added in some new ones as well. So I'll be now monitoring the Q&A box and the chat box if you have anything to ask or any comments you want to say. Um, if you have any other bits of gossip or scandalous stories that you've heard about Niagara and Lake's past and you want to know more about them, you can feel free to ask those questions. And if we don't know the answers now, we can look into them and get back to you about those. So for now, I will turn it over to Babs. Hi, everybody. And thank you for joining us on this one. It's a fun one to do and it reminds me of all these great things we have in town that we can't do right now, but you know, it's still, we're doing it. And thanks to all of you who join in. So when we did this last year, we started out and we walked up the road and the first place we stopped at was Parliament Oak. Parliament Oak, that place that has caused such controversy in town and is still sitting there empty and all we want to do is to use it. But there is a myth that under Parliament Oak school, there is a tunnel that leads all the way from Regent Street to King Street. Do, by the way, I'm gonna be reading from notes, so I'm gonna be looking away from you at times, so I'm sorry if I don't meet your eyes all the time. No, I'm not, I am here. So it was believed that this tunnel, for some people believed it was part of the Underground Railroad to help the escaping slaves, but we know that that isn't necessarily so. Are there any tunnels there? Were there any tunnels there? The Underground Railroad, as we all know now so much more, was not really a real railroad and we weren't a real terminus, although even that now has come up for debate. And actually I urge you to check out our Voices of Freedom da, 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 and go and check out the website because there is information there that actually we might've been more of a terminus than we realized because there were homes that people did actually, there's some evidence that people came here, but we were so close to the river, as you know. So check that out and theofpark.org. So here's our wonderful school, Parliament Oak. I know this place inside out. That location is so far from the water, it would not be efficient for anyone to have a tunnel and not for anyone to use. But what we do know is that when the school was being built there, a truck did sink into the ground and you know it revealed a brick arch and apparently that might have been a tunnel. So what was going on there? What was going on? On that location, there used to be one of the finest homes in Niagara, and it belonged to Senator Josiah Plum. So Senator, and those are the tunnels. Well, see, I've already forgotten what I put in the thing. So the Plum home, look at that gorgeous home. In 1871, Josiah Plum bought the home from the widow of Judge Campbell. I'm not sure if that's important, but it's an interesting fact. It's said that the, the, the Plum, he, Mr. Plum, came to Niagara to see the most beautiful street in the world. The street, the street was Elizabeth Street, daughter of Samuel Street, a Niagara resident, and they married. And they married in 1849 and had six children, three girls and three boys. But his wife died in 1868. The house, had 20 rooms, 20 rooms, and 10 fireplaces. There were four staircases, looking at that picture now I'm going, I'd like to have seen inside there, one of which was circular. And also downstairs, they had the latest in new technology, a basement kitchen, a wood-burning stove. That's not my cell phone, that's the office phone, just telling you. They had the latest in new technology. I suppose you could unplug it. Maybe someone else will come and help. So uh, they had the latest in new technology, a basement kitchen, a wood-burning stove, a fruit cellar, 
a stone arch downstairs that could have been part of this kitchen. Remember the arch. The arch. There he is. There's Senator Josiah Plum. Distinguished looking chap there. So there also happened to be a hidden staircase that led down to a billiard room that he had built to entertain his VIP friends. Senator Plum was one of the founders of the Conservative Party and he entertained all of the best and the most important. Oh dear, yes, even His Royal Highness, Prince, Prince George, later King George V, grandson, this was the grandson of Victoria, he paid him a visit and he loved playing croquet and so he played croquet with the youngest Miss Plum, Annie. And that was in 1883, a well-known royal visit. They say that Plum was worth $500,000. It's a lot of money. Anyway, in the 40s, this home was taken apart, piece by piece, his home was taken apart. And we have here the new school that was built. My son went there for 12 years. And when work began on this new school, a truck suddenly sank into the ground. And after the truck was pulled out from the holes, Noel Haynes found that he had a broken brick lined tunnel there with an arched ceiling. So with a flashlight, he climbed into the tunnel and walked all the way to Regent Street. So he says, well, so he says, in the case though, in what actually did happen was that there were students that could actually get down and walk into this arch and this tunnel. And we believe that common sense says that it was probably some open plumbing or even a sewer pipe, probably, and big enough that a small child could walk through. There is sadly no evidence of any troubles. No, no. So here we go. Moving on, Rockamore Manor. Brockamore Manor. How many of you have ever stayed there? I can't see you. I, can't, I don't know if you're ticking or have ever stayed there. It actually does sound quite delightful. And some of their breakfasts are to die for their food. And your Brockamore Manor is a B&B, it's a National Historic Site, but not just for the stunning natural home that it is on its acreage of ground, no, and its historic gardens and gorgeous trees. It was first built in 1809 by Captain John Powell for his wife, Isabella, and their family. John Powell, famous name in this part of the world, was the son of Chief Justice William Dunner Powell. And Dunner Powell was a lawyer, a judge, an office holder, a politician, an author, and he was Chief Justice of Upper Canada, although it took him many years to become Chief Justice of Upper Canada. He was incredibly controversial and uh, lived a long life and managed to, didn't have a son, he didn't think that he, you know, didn't think at first he was gonna do anything. Nor did his father think he was going to do anything. Apparently, in you know, his later, in his early years, he was very good at cricket and entertaining the girls. But he ended up being here in Canada and becoming very influential. So his son, John Powell, who built this place, uh, was uh, he became a politician in his own right, uh, and he was registrar of the district of uh, Niagara, and captain of militia, and so on. He also had a son named John Powell, and it gets so confusing because everybody has the same name. His son, John Powell, would become alderman in Toronto in that fateful year of 1837, all of you history buffs will know, and then he became mayor from 1838 to 1840, and all very nicely interwoven with the family compact. Yes, there you go. Oh, da, 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 da. So, the John Powell's, this John Powell, this one on that screen, his real claim to fame is that due to his connections, important people came of visiting. Now, his father-in-law was the estrangely named Enos Shaw, A-E-N-E-A-S Shaw. Enos Shaw was a good friend of no other than John Graves Simcoe. And the two men became fast friends during the American Revolution when they fought on the British side, of course. John Powell, our John Powell again, this guy, had married his daughter, Isabella. Isabella had a sister, Sophia. And Sophia came to live with them in Newark. Now her father, Mr. Shaw, was a frequent visitor. And the person he knew who came along and visited was none other than Isaac Brock. Isaac Brock and Sophia, they fell in love. 
So there we go. And apparently it wasn't just her falling in love. Apparently it was uh, Isaac too. So as tensions grew between Britain and the United States during the early 1800s, and as Brock went from one end of Upper Canada to the other, another kind of tension was growing too between himself and Sophia. And eventually, so they say, all this love and adoration led to a secret engagement. Unfortunately, Isaac Brock, did you know this, was not very well off. I mean, he looks wealthy, doesn't he? And we always think they were probably loaded, but actually he wasn't. His family had debt and he had debt and his, his brother had lost a fair fortune on warships. Not really sure how that happens. I'm sure there's many of you out there that can tell me how. And so Brock didn't really have the kind of money that befitted a lady of Sophia's station. So they say he put off the wedding and hoped to make more money in the time to come. <laughs> Unfortunately, all best plans on June the 18th, 1812, the United States declared war on Britain. And as Thomas Jefferson infamous, infamously declared, it would just be a matter of mere marching. Isaac Brock was apparently adored and respected by many. He was efficient, he was empathetic, he was charismatic, and all six feet of him inspired all those around him, and obviously our Sophia. During the early hours of October 13th, here we go, that day, 1812, drum roll, Isaac Brock awoke to the sounds of cannon fire as the Americans invaded Upper Canada at Queenston Heights. Jumping onto his sturdy white horse, he raced to the battle, but he took time, they say, to stop at the home of his love, to say a brief goodbye. And Sophia, who kept a brave face because she was fair and strong, must have had her heart pounding with anguish. She met him and she provided him with a cup of coffee to keep him warm. What we don't know is, is whether she gave him milk and sugar. Anyway, that might have made all the difference if he'd have just stayed for another little tot or something. And he rode off into history. When she heard of his death, Sophia was heartbroken and spent her remaining years living with her sister <laughs> and her brother-in-law in the Powell House, what was left of it, until her death. Part of the Powell House may have actually survived. I'll ask Sarah to confirm this. But it's said that a part of it, probably the kitchen, survived the burning. And it was rebuilt later on by Mr. Thomas McCormick. And then James Bolton was an owner. And then the rather famous Duncan Malloy, captain of the seas here. And today it is known as Brockamore. I want to say Brockamore today, but it's Brockamore. Love of Brock. And the owner is frequently asked about the ghost that is always near one of the Armors. It's very real, they say, and very scary, they say. And now here is your 30 second history lesson. Yes, it's coming. Come on, 30 second history lesson. Uh oh. Here we go. your 30 second history lesson. I know, self promo. Remember, anyone saw it years ago? You know, it does it all, it just makes my heart go. So now look where we're at. We're down to the pub. We're at the Angel Inn, that wonderful Angel, Angel Inn. And you know, lots of us know the rumors, what goes on down there. Uh, well, what they say goes on down there. The rumor is of course that 
A Captain Swayze was held in the basement of the Angel Inn and was tortured and murdered during the War of 1812. Well, this building wasn't even around in the War of 1812. The buildings on that lot were all closer to King Street and the original building was a residence of D.W. Smith who was Governor Simcoe's Deputy Surveyor General. It was known as Government House. And people such as Sir Isaac Brock and other officers could be housed there. They were all destroyed in the War of 1812 after which the land was granted to the town. A few lots belonging to Smith were sold off and the Angel Inn was built around 1820 on one of those lots by John Ross, the inn's first owner. In 1970, <coughs> it was reopened as the Angel Inn by the Ledoux family. And Francis Ledoux is a pretty good storyteller. Was it Colin Swayze? Was it Isaac Swayze? Or another Isaac Swayze? Huh, or was it Florence? So there's a story about Captain Swayze. Colin or Isaac, that he was captured, imprisoned, about to be killed for being a loyalist, imprisoned and killed. Oh my God. On the day of his execution, on this, for this particular Swayze, his wife dressed up like a man to look like him so that he could escape. And he did. Was it Colin or was it Isaac? Both were real and both lived. A real Isaac Swayze was somewhat infamous in political circles, challenged the political elite, was charged with sedition, which this sounds like such the most perfect thing to be charged with, if you're gonna be charged with anything, get charged with sedition, and even ran for parliament, which makes absolute sense, doesn't it? Which turned out he was one of the good guys, because that Swayze actually wanted, wanted Joseph Wilcox, one of the Canadian volunteers who burned our town down, put in jail for slanderous language. So he was a good guy. Now, Florence Ledoux, unfortunately, is no longer with us. But while she was the owner, she said that many psychics and other visitors of the Angel Inn claim to have heard and seen the spirit of Captain Colin Swayze, a British officer tortured by the Americans to gain his military secrets. Hmm, well, I've never seen it myself, said owner Florence Ledoux before she passed, but many swear it to be real. They've seen him standing in a corner, she says, or walking into the dining room, she swore. Some people say they've even heard a harpsichord or a tinny little piano playing. One customer came to me, she says, shaking like a leaf, and we had to get him out of the room. I suppose, she said, there's a mystique here that the public, they don't want to understand. They just need to know it's there. But there was another Swayze, this Isaac, another Isaac Swayze, not the other one that was the infamous political one charged with sedition. This was another Isaac Swayze. Odd names to have so many people with the same name. And he was a heavy drinker who was killed a decade after the war when his carriage overturned. Well, my theory is that he'd been drinking at the Angel Inn that night before heading home and his ghost still haunts the place because he was terribly addled because of a blow to his head after he drank too much at the bar. Still, it should be noted that a full confession of the whole fictitious event and the whole story appears in Florence's obituary, blessed by her family. Ah, I feel like we should have a song, don't you? A song now? Now, many of you will recognize this. Matilda Bolton. Matilda, while we might think it's actually Pam is actually a real person. Matilda Bolton is one hot lady in town. She was born January the 26th, 1857, known as the Witch of Niagara. What a way to go out, eh? The Witch of Niagara. I could hex you in the flash of a bat's eye, she would be heard saying. And she was a little nutty. Even Terry Bolton admits to that. She said, this town, this town does not understand private property. And what is private property? She said, you take something from me without asking and I will move mountains, move mountains to get it back. And she wrote countless letters to point this out. Countless, countless, countless letters. She never stopped writing letters all her life. Bolton lived above a shop on Queen Street. 
but she also owned property that ran down to the Niagara River. There was a delightful tale of her suing the town of Niagara on the Lake for stealing her property. She always has something to say. I'm just going to go back here. Yeah. The town had given her permission to dredge the river. The town had the town had given the town had given permission to dredge the river to the people who were going to dredge the, the river. They had given permission to the people to dredge the river to remove the excess sediment so that the dock company could continue to operate their business. They'd given permission for this to happen. However, Matilda claimed her property line extended 10 feet into the river so that she did not give permission for them to go out and dredge her property. Therefore, she believed they had stolen her property and she took it to the local courts and she took it to the provincial courts and she took it to the federal courts and they all turned their backs on her. So she took it all the way to the Supreme Court and she won her case. Matilda Bolton won her chapter. She, she won and they had to give her so much money. She got a check sent to her and you know what she did with it? With a colossal amount of money, she went like that, tore it up. She said, it wasn't about the check, it's not about the money. She said, I tore it into a million pieces. It was the principle of the thing they did. Throughout her life, she seemed to have one battle after another with this town. These letters you see, this is all the stuff she would write, write, write. In 1903, she had rented a property to a widow in town, Mrs. A. Clement, another really well-known local name. And Mrs. Clement had two children and apparently the dear Mrs. Clement, the widow, was having great difficulty paying her rent. So Miss Matilda did not keep up her payment on the taxes of the place. And therefore the, the town in its wisdom forced the, her to go after the rent. And when she wasn't going after it, they went after the rent and took the taxes right out of the rent. They forced it out of this poor widow. So Matilda was beside herself with that. And she was, she so despised the town tax collectors, Reed and Burns, that she suggested they should be fired. They should never be allowed to operate in their positions. And she wrote a million letters for that too. She said, thank God I am a lady, but a woman, I am not a lady, but a woman, thank God I'm not a lady, but a woman who has tried to do good helping people and carry on with her business. Yeah, she was that. She also could not bear to see people's ankles, young girls. She didn't like the changing fashions. She dressed in strict black clothes. And she did not want to see the young girls with all these bare legs. And as they became more exposed, she got angrier and angrier. And she started striking at the girls. She struck them across their legs. And it was because to her, it was a blatant disregard of etiquette. And Muriel Fellows and Margot Davy more than once felt her little slap and rage across their legs. And the story goes, which is why you have the line, where's that potty? The story goes, and that's what she's holding there, is that she was not averse to tipping her potty out the window at people who harassed her. What was in the potty? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Matilda owned so much of the town. She owned the Beaches area, she owned Mary Street, she had property onto Laser Street, the Market Square, Queen Street. She had property everywhere. And Terry Bolton has the Beaches area now, a gorgeous piece of property that is beautifully looked after. She was super smart. She was super smart. God, it keeps going ahead. She was super smart. She was the second wife, by the way, of John Jack Bolton, a local Niagara fishing family, obviously still have that property down there. But here's the thing. It's said that she had a couple of the town's mayors at all times in her back pocket, or as it would be Matilda, in her apron pocket. I think she was a diamond. I think we should find out a whole lot more about her and do a whole show on Matilda. Okay, now I'll actually let it go on. So it just wants to, even I put my hand over my mouth, it just does it. Here we go, executions. Ooh. Between 1792, August 1792, big year 1792, you know, you get full marks if everyone knows what happened in 1792, and September 1800, there were six cases ending in capital convictions here in Niagara. This is the original courthouse we're looking at here. Four for burglary, one for forgery, and one for murder. 
Three of the trials were of black slaves, among them Jack York. And the first execution in the province's history was of the black slave Josiah Cutton in 1792. Big year. The first execution for murder and the first execution of a woman occurred in 1801. Mary Osborne, later Mary London, was the first woman executed here in Niagara on the Lake. Mary Osborne, how did it all happen, Mary? So in 1789, Bartholomew London, that's the man, Bartholomew London, came to Niagara on the Lake with his four children and four grandchildren, not a young man, but widowed. He was a small farmer from New Jersey who claimed to have been imprisoned, and the word claim is big there, been imprisoned during the American Revolution because of his loyalty to the British and entered the province with all those children. But it wasn't that many, I suppose, back then, four and four, four children, four grandchildren. He ended up being granted 200 acres of land in the township of Salt Fleet. An older man, as I said, he was unmarried. And when he arrived he, in the colony, one of the things he needed to do as they ordered was to find themselves a woman, get himself a gal. And he married the young Mary Osborne an immigrant from Pennsylvania, whose family was still back there and she was here on her own. The union was complicated right from the start because there was a man, George Nemiers, who was 28, much closer to the age of Mary, and he was from Carlisle, also in Pennsylvania. He worked as a laborer on the farm, on the London family farm. And by 1800, Mary and George were lovers. So it was a troubled marriage, obviously, and it's now known that Mary was having an affair with George for more than a year before she married the elderly Bartholomew. Then, how convenient, Bartholomew died on February the 17th, 1801. Mary, four months pregnant at the time, and George were arrested and charged with felony and murder. The trial was sensational. It began August the 14th, 14 people as witnesses, presiding Judge Henry Alcock. Absolutely sensational. Exposing the adultery of young lovers, the betrayal of an elderly, poor husband, good husband, providing husband. The role of unnamed accomplices and confidants and clandestine trips to obtain poison. Oh my God, it was all like a Christie everywhere. After an eight hour investigation of the witnesses, eight hours, eight hours, a mere eight hours, the coroners and medical men established that the death was caused from being poisoned and not from a skull fracture, which had been the initial cause they thought. Although there was lack of positive proof as to the person or persons who administered this poison, the facts and the numerous circumstances left no room for doubt. After the jury delivered its verdict of guilty, Alcock, Judge Alcock, who had all along charged with mercy, pronounced the dreadful sentence. On the morning of August the 17th, the lovers were to be hanged until they were dead and afterwards their bodies to be dissected. As this case was very well documented by one Sylvester Tiffany, he was able to actually interview the couple. When he interviewed George, George blamed Mary for everything including leading him to have an affair to murder the bugger. Mary had suggested killing Bartholomew with a gun and then suggested poison. Had nothing whatever to do with him. Yeah, right. Then George apparently didn't know that he went to Ancaster to get the poison, two ounces of arsenic and one ounce of opium. I guess he didn't remember doing that. George then confessed that he wanted the woman, not the estate, and that he had hit Bartholomew with a shoe hammer on the head, causing the skull fracture. Just a little thing, so why they only had a shoe hammer. Mary only revealed a part of her confession in the trial and discussed an unnamed third party that helped kill Bartholomew. She later confessed, I am guilty. I gave the poison and I knew it. She then says she did not know who was the father of her child. The girl, Catherine, by now had been born four days before she was put on the gallows. When Mary came out onto the gallows on August the 17th, she said, may this be a warning to you all. 
and ask for God to have mercy on her soul. Ah, poor Mary. Now we're moving down the street to the Rowley House, that wonderful house. 177 King Street, that's where we are now, ladies and gentlemen. King Street, known as the Rowley House, not just the Rowley scandal, it's known as the Rowley House. In 1881, Salmon Rowley met Fanny Ross, soon to be Fanny Ross Rowley. Five years later, he hired Walter Davidson and him and Fanny set up here. Walter Davidson built this home on King Street, three floors, more rooms than Fanny had ever known, had ever had, its own tower, but the towers, its own balconies. After all, Fanny's grandfather was William Riley. William Riley was enslaved in Fredericksburg, Virginia. He arrived in Black Rock, near Buffalo, New York, with his enslaver. It was 19, 1802, whatever. They come all the way from Virginia so his master could see Niagara Falls. William Riley, a slave, met a good Samaritan, a gentleman from Niagara. The gentleman pointed to the north and told him he could be free across that river. William Riley could smell freedom. So he escaped to the cornfields outside of Black Rock, stayed hidden there for days, and his enslavers spent all those same days searching for him. He prayed the dogs would not come out. A runaway slave was not only lost property, a runaway slave was lost investment, lost profit. And William Riley was a valuable slave. He was a coachman. He was able to handle his master's six horses with ease. Not someone his master would want to let go. His slaver never did find him. And like many before him and the many thousands after him, William Riley found his way across the river to freedom. But for William Riley, hiding in the cornfield, he had no way of knowing then that by crossing that river, he gave freedom to so many others. You can find his full story on the Voices of Freedom site. Salmon Rowley, who met his granddaughter, was born in Elmira, New York, and became a successful glass merchant manufacturer in Philadelphia. He had, this is his company. Called it Hero Fruit Jar, called it Hero after the soldiers. He was married to Anna Jones and was father to a daughter, and he had several patents for his jam jars. When he left Philadelphia, he left the operation of his glass factory to his son-in-law and the care of his daughter, to the care of his wife, Anna, to his daughter. He had a wife that no one can find out very little about her anyway. We think she might have been unwell. There's rumors that she might have been mentally unwell. He left. His daughter had married into the Kennedy family and the Kennedy family even back then had lots of ties, as you know. And they supported this company when he started going under. So a lot of money went back into this company of his. It's a huge, fascinating history, jam jars, the, the science behind them and the manufacturing and the, the money that was spent on them because it was such an interesting new science. Because the new science meant that people could have less spoilage. So food could be stored in a wholly different way. So he came up here and he built that house. Back in Philadelphia, the company is still listed. The son-in-law continued to run it, manage it for many, many years. While on a business trip back to Philadelphia in 1905, Salmon died and became, Fanny became a widow up here. She took his name, we have to assume they were actually married. And she became a very wealthy widow here because he had incredible properties, considerable amount of money he'd spent on the properties on Queen Street, the Rowley block, all became hers. She was the only woman that had that much property in town. They had two girls, both died within the first year of their life, babies. 
and then they adopted. So she stayed here with the daughter, Maud, who later became a piano teacher. So that was a trivia. And then they, had, they went to Cleveland, and eventually came back here. And Franny is buried here. She was an incredibly rich, wealthy woman. But here's the thing. Franny's story is an example of the complicated and fascinating interracial relationships at that time and how acknowledging race had its super complexities then. Fanny Ross Rowley began life as an African granddaughter of a slave and ended it as a white woman. The records show her as being French Canadian and then white. The granddaughter of freedom seeker William Riley was brought back to rest in Niagara and is buried here in St. Mark's beside her mother and her two daughters. And she is. She's an interesting story. Sounds like another musical to me. Now, here we go. St. Mark's, the beautiful St. Mark's. How to lose the farm? Oh, MacDonald had, anyway, how do we lose a farm? Well, first of all, you have an affair with people that you work with. That's one way to lose the farm. Get an angry wife, you're gonna lose the farm. In the latter part of the 19th century, around 1860 or so, Peter Service, that's him there, very debonair, was a prominent community member in the local militia and appointed justice of the peace for the Niagara Township. The Service family, it should be noted also, were very well known as United Empire lawyers. The Service family had arrived in the Americas from the German Palatinate in 1726, so they were known as Palatines. Palatines, which is interesting because we have we heard that word over here with Palatine and winery, and now we know now that's where it comes from in part. It's a very they came here because of the very favorable, the Germans came here because of the very favorable attitude towards them from the British government to bring settlers over into the North American colonies. During the revolution, the family's loyalist sympathies led the family to being uh, held, the, lots of the members of the family and the head of the family being killed. And so they joined the British patriotic forces and the sons joined the patriotic forces. And after the war ended, the family tried first to reestablish their lives in the newly formed United States, but eventually joined the Loyalist migration to Upper Canada. And there they successfully established new mills using the patronage extended to them by the British government to Loyalists. Unfortunately, Peter Service was building on this family fortune was good, but maybe wasn't all that smart. He was a good community member, but not really good at running the family farm and the mills. He mortgaged the mills on Four Mile Creek to the point of ruin. That's Four Mile Creek, by the way, in that picture. And his wife, Mary, look at her there, that's Mary Service. Just look at the look in her face. As I gather, she was the most efficient and wonderful person to, she never let anything go. But he started being unfaithful with one of the workers. He had a lot of women working with him at the mill, apparently. The Toronto Globe reported on this, saying he was having adulterous intercourse with one Mary Canile. Can you imagine writing that, that word? I had to say it was difficult to say. After discovering this fact about her husband, <laughs> Mary legally separated, but she certainly didn't go anywhere. And the service farm and the mills were eventually transferred over to Mary's name in about 1875. Mary continued to raise her four children at the farm and hired outside labor to run the mill and the blacksmith shop, keeping meticulous records. And all of this is apparently documented right here, somewhere at the museum. But the farm and the mills were in so much debt that Mary did not have clear title until 1892. I think Shauna will confirm that with me. In the meantime, in 1887, Peter unfortunately, or fortunately, died. But the swine, the swine did not leave Mary as a beneficiary so that that same year in 1887, our amazing Mary, da -da -da -da, Mary, had to mortgage the farm for 3,000, but had it all paid off by 1898, just over 10 years. I could use her chutzpah really use her husband. She was originally from the Boer family, by the way, married into the Fert Fert service family, and she adamantly refused to allow her husband to be buried on the service farm, on the burial site of his family's burial site on his family's farm. She said, sorry, Buster, you're not getting buried there. And she packed him off to St. Saint, Saint, Saint Mark's. So he was the first service member to be buried outside of the family plot. We can't really understand how that would be, but back then it was huge. It was huge. So 
he's not there now alone. He's there now, obviously, but he's not alone. A lot more services apparently eventually came in there. And then in 1899, right before the turn of the century, the highly efficient and extremely crisp Mary joined the United Empire Loyalist Association, renamed the farm Palatine Hill, became friends with Janet Conahan, who published an article on Palatine Hill in pamphlet number five. All of you love Janet's writing. And our wonderful, hardworking Mary eventually died in 1905, made it into the turn of the century. And she is buried with the rest of the service family mm -hmm, on the farm. And the old mill eventually, eventually stopped running after Mary died. No one could do what she did, I guess. And it collapsed in a storm in 1811. Here we have, if you want to go to St. Mark's, it's hard. Donald Coombe had to tell me where to look for Peter's grave. I had to really look. It's near the corner where Addison is. You can dig around there and find it. As a postscript to this story, Prince of Wales, another Prince of Wales, this one that became Edward VII. So the first one we showed you, that was this one's, this one is his father. He came to Canada when he was just a young 18 year old and he went to see the farm. How I wish my mother, Queen Victoria, could see and taste such delicious peaches, he said to Peter Servers. And Peter Servers, not knowing who he was talking to, responded, why the hell didn't you tell me? I'll invite you bring the old lady with you. Oh, didn't go down quite so well as he thought. Unfortunately, William Kirby had omitted to tell Peter Service whose guest was and brought out to farm. Very peachy, peachy. Anyway, another prince came here to see us. We've had a few now. Moving on. Here we go, moving down the street, guys. Ooh, the Masonic mystery. Da, 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 da. William Morgan was an anti Masonic who threatened to reveal the secrets of the Freemasonry. Hope I'm okay saying all this here. Freemasonry originated in its modern form in the late 17th century. Freemasonry is organized into lodges and decrees with grandmasters, masters, and wardens with the same rituals and traditions that were first devised by Solomon, king of Israel, in the building of the temple. Hundreds of years. Masonic buildings where lodges and their members are, uh, on, where they meet are sometimes called Temples, but that's apparently reference to the King Solomon's temple. Now I'm making some assumptions here because this is, of course, is a secret society and not everything has been written about and is out there. But it's what is generally regarded as the theory is where it came from. It is an international secret fraternal movement with a history rooted in the guilds of British stonemasons of the Middle Ages. It goes back a long way. It offers its male members, intellectual gatherings, stimulation, mutual aid with fraternal friendships and fellowships and meetings marked by solemn oaths, secret signs, elaborate rituals. And it's worldwide and it has a network of local lodges which attract the allegiance of affluent merchants, military officers, professionals, the royal families. By the 1820s, it was very well established in Upper Canada with more than two dozen lodges belong to the second provincial Grand Lodge, including two in New York. In mid-September 1826, Batavia resident William Morgan went missing. Mysteriously, room abounded. No one knew what had actually happened to him. But here's the thing. Late in 1826, same year, William Morgan's book appeared and it revealed many secrets about the Freemasons. Taking a chance there. Less than 100 pages, the book went through the secrets and mysteries, room arrangement, voting process, dress, paraphernalia, rituals, signals, gestures, solemn oaths, etc., 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 etc. And here's what we think might have happened. Is this rumor? Is this scandal? Is this gossip? Four men of the Freemasons kidnapped Morgan and brought him to Fort Niagara. Those secrets were revealed and the Freemason did not want them revealed. Their plan was to bring Morgan to the upper Canadian Masons and they were planning to put Morgan 
aboard a British man of war, and he was going to be handed over to Mohawk chief Joseph Brad to be executed. Brad declined. Brad said he had no knowledge of this, no one discussed it with him, and he would not do it. The Freemasons apparently took the unfortunate Morgan back to Fort Niagara, where he would be murdered in cold blood. The Freemasons cut his throat from ear to ear, cut out his tongue and buried it in the sand, and then drowned his body in the lake. In the result of this murder being related to the Freemasons, the Freemasonry lost many lodges and members. In Upper Canada alone, out of the 26 lodges that existed and were created then, 18 of them closed, apparently, or due to this incident. Rumor, fact, or gossip, I leave it up to you. I just want you to think of that tongue in the sand. Mr. Hugh Hutchison. We've talked a lot about Mr. Hugh Hutchison. There's the Prince of Wales. December the 12th, 1895, the town was thrown into great excitement on Tuesday evening when the report got abroad that Mr. Hugh Hutchison had committed suicide by blowing his brains out with a shotgun in William Long Stable. William Long, the Prince of Wales Hotel, Long's Hotel. That was the original Prince of Wales. No reason can be assigned for the rash act except temporary insanity. Mr. Hutchison, who was in his 63rd year, was a retired family, sorry, a retired farmer of means, and had for the past 15 years boarded with Mr. William Long, having no known family. He's led a quiet life, being one of the last to be suspected of ending his life in such a way. But he has been troubled, the newspaper article said, with fits of illness, but during the last three or four days, he was in particularly melancholy spirits. But he was also mixed up in some infraction of the game laws by exporting one or two deer. That's why the deer is on that screen. Exporting one or two deer across the river to the American side, which no doubt helped to unsettle his mind somewhat. And on Tuesday afternoon, his actions were enough to cause suspicion having asked different people if he could borrow their revolver for a while, and he was unable to do so. Between three and four o'clock, he went over to Mr. O. Taylor's blacksmith shop and asked him to lend him his shotgun, stating that he wished to shoot a cat, which he said troubled him at night, taking him at his word. He gave him a gun, he loaded it, and off he went. As the deceased had been out so long, Mr. Long then became somewhat alarmed and with Mr. Taylor went out to the barn to see where he was in one of the box stores as lifeless form was found. He had blown out his brains with a shotgun. And a coroner's inquest was held on the remains yesterday morning, said the paper, and a verdict was brought in of suicide by shooting while under a temporary fit of insanity. He was unmarried, leaves to mourn his untimely end, a brother and a sister. The funeral will take place today. He was paying $6 a night to stay at that hotel, the former Prince of Wales. The cat survived. Now we have, oops, go back, go back, giving it all away. Mr. Charles Camage. Mr. Charles Camage, crazy Camage. Crazy Camage, he was the headmaster of the grammar school in St. Catharines in 1864. He was hired in the place of Reverend Mr. Cooper to develop the grammar school, to become more efficient and prosperous and reduce the fees of the school and by other means so that he would boost the attendance, all of which he did from 13 members to 40. Four years later, Camage asked the board of trustees at the grammar school for a raise and they refused. In retaliation, Camage left the grammar school with a full year's salary upon dismissal and began the Niagara Grammar School that opened in 1871. In 1874, I know these dates are hard to remember, it's just think about it in the 1870s, Camage was considered an inefficient teacher as he was sticking his nose 
in matters that were not part of his job. And he also seemed to have a tendency to have a vindictiveness towards too many people. He became known as Crazy Cambridge. While trying to defend that, he was of sound mind, but apparently he failed to do so. In the following year, himself and his wife were both accused of mistreating Miss Rye's orphans, Miss Maria Rye's orphans, including, as the item said, and the report on the girl said, they were whipped and dressed disgracefully. They were then charged. They were actually charged with the mistreatment of their servant, one Agnes Franken, with misuse, cruelty, and ill treatment. On July 25th, 1895, two years later, the following was released. Mrs. Camage was preparing his breakfast, which he told her not to bring up to him, that he would be down presently. Shortly after he said this, Mrs. Camage heard the report of a pistol and immediately went up to his room where she found him lying on the floor on his back, dead, with a revolver in his hand. We don't know what hand. Dr. Anderson was sent for at once, who upon examination said that death was instantaneous, the ball having entered behind the left ear and taking an upward course behind, behind and penetrating the brain. Now, what you all have to think about is what hand did he do it with? Revolver in his hand, death was instantaneous, up there, left ear, up with got. Or is Mrs. Cameron just thinking about the days when she didn't really want crazy Cameron around anymore? They lived at this house. This is King Street. It's 233 King, 266 King Street. And Margot Fife lived there for many, many years with a cat. And Margot Fife's cat used to come down to my house on Delaney Street in the dock area on a regular basis. And it used to come down even though it was a, an indoor cat. And it would come down to my house and fight with my cat. It came all the way down to fight with my cat. My cat, Wish. And I ended up with hundreds of vet bills because this cat came down and I said, this is that crazy Camage cat. Hundreds of dog cat bills. Crazy Camage cat. Sorry, Margo. Here we go. I spy my little. Then there was Catherine Poole. How you might ask, how does a nice Canadian girl become a spy? Let's sit back a little to the War of 1812. Put her in at the end because I just like her so much. Well, during the War of 1812, there's a lot of people who had a reason to be angry. Look at me with the cat. Imagine what we'd be like if we had Americans living all over town. The women, the young children, the elders here were all allowed to stay, but in their homes, that was it. The Americans were here and all their menfolk were gone. They missed the help in their fields. They didn't have wood, food, supplies. And most of what they had was taken by the Americans. And often they didn't come knocking and asking politely. During the war, during the war of 1812, Catherine Poole's family lived in Niagara. Her brothers had enlisted as soldiers and her father was in the militia. But her fiance, Bill, was killed early in the war. Now, it was a dangerous time. People were living in the occupied zone. The women had seen fathers and sons sent off to be prisoners in the war camps far away. And there was this constant worry about those who were fighting. And the women didn't like it, but they were tough. The Americans surrounded the town with border guards and the British troops and their native allies were anxious to know what was going on here in town, here and inside the fort. Catherine Poole was happy to oblige and get information to the troops. She would regularly take messages and maps to the British, giving them vital information on American troop activity. So Laura Secord was not alone in this kind of bravery. Catherine Poole would walk up to those border guards and give those Yankees a smile, perhaps flirt a little, laugh a little, wink a little, and maybe she'd give them a nice little cherry pie. And they let her go most anywhere she pleased with more than just bloomers under her skirt. <sighs> Back then women could do so much more. So that's how you become 
a nice Canadian spy. Ladies and gentlemen, the 455, I think we might bring it in at that as our closing one. Amy, do you think? Seeing as how we're at that Yes, time. we do have a few questions, so I just want to quickly ask those. Um, Mona asks if there's still Freemason members in Niagara-on-the-Lake, and yes, there are. The, the lodge is still an active lodge, and there's still um, meetings held there, and we actually um, got a collection from the Masonic Lodge for the museum uh, last year. I think it was last year, maybe the year before. Um, so we have some items from their historic collection that they were holding there. Um, and Mona asks, is there a link between Palatine Winery and the family that you mentioned? I looked it up and I don't believe there is. I think they just, the Neufelds who run Palatine Winery, they don't seem to have, they've been around, but not for the four, three, four hundred years that the services, I think there is a, there's, it was just, there was the, they just assume the name and because of that, there's such a connection to the Palatinates with that's the German area that a lot of people that, that people came here. And so that would be very well known to anyone with German ancestry. Yeah, so it is, it is on the property of, um, where the Servas family home was, the, the winery. Are you asking me? No, I'm, I'm saying. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then Darlene Pam was asking about the jars, the jam jars. <laughs> um, and she said on the left uh, jar, the, under the word hero, it looks like the iron German cross. Whether, yes. Was there significance of that yes, on this? There was a cross and he, that was his, that was Lowry, Rowley's signature cross. And, and he did it again to honor the American soldiers. And there was a lot of false jars made, and that was how they knew whether that was his or not, because they would do a very incorrect cross. But again, it was all to honor the veterans. Wonderful, and then Darlene also asks, she says, this is fabulous, I can listen to these stories forever. Does the museum have any books on these stories? And we don't have any books, but that, could be a, a thing to do. Book. <laughs> Love um, to do that. Most of the stories are uh, kind of found first starting just myths and, and, and things that people have heard. Some of the things that we searched for, we, you know, we searched for um, executions and things like that so that we could come up with some of these stories. But a lot of them just came out of stories that we've heard or that people have asked us over the years over and over, something like the tunnels comes up all the time, um, people asking all the time. So um, that's how we, we got a lot of these stories, but it would be great to put them into a book of some kind. And a good hats off to uh, Shona and Rebecca last summer who did the initial research. Absolutely. So thank you everyone. If you have other questions, feel free to send them to us at contact at nhsm.ca or if you have other little um, rumors and myths that you've heard about Niagara's history that you're wondering if it's true or if there's a bigger story behind it, feel free to send them our way and we'll, we'll do some digging and see what we can find. So thank you again Babs for presenting today, wonderful stories. Next week on Thursday, August 20th at 4 p.m., we're hosting John Henry, who lives in New York City, so it's great that we can uh, host him on Zoom because he wasn't able to come down live. And he's presenting the Cayuga and her consorts, remembering those beloved Niagara to Tor Toronto steamers. So this is another presentation in our All Along the Waterfront series, which is sponsored by uh, Jeffrey and Lorraine Joyner. We're hoping to see you guys next week online and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for joining us today.